Welcome back to On The Move with Victor Shi. Today is Wednesday, January 25th. And today we're going to be talking about the right wing news because more than ever before, it's critical for people to know how to identify the lies that Republicans in the media are telling us and how we can push back against them. In addition, Democrats too need to know how to take the right wing narratives and counter them effectively. And that is exactly what my guest today has been doing over the past few years with the Lincoln Project and now with Resolute Square. And he is Stuart Stevens, who I'm sure all of you have seen and read before in some way. Stuart is a longtime political veteran and has worked on many, many campaigns, too long for me to list, and is in this fight to save democracy and is such an essential voice. Stuart, it's so great to see you and to finally chat with you. Yeah, I know, Victor. Uh, thanks for asking me the party. Of course. So you and I are lucky to be part of Resolute Square, which is an organization that's dedicated to calling out BS right-wing narratives, basically. But in order to understand those narratives, I I think it's important to understand what allows those narratives to fester and grow. And what pops into my mind at the outset is right-wing news channels, like maybe not news channels, but channels like Fox News and Newsmax. Can you walk us through how those right-wing news media companies operate? You know, there's a fascinating book... um, by a a professor um, at UVA named Nicole Himmer, Hmm. who wrote a book called Messengers on the Right. And she um, wrote it because she's from Iowa, like a farm girl from Iowa, uh, had this very reasonable middle-of-the-road dad, and she slowly saw him get sucked into this Fox News vortex. Mm -hmm. And being an academician, she was like, how did this happen? Um, She didn't just yell at her dad. She wanted to know more about it. So it led her to write this book. And I cannot recommend it more, Victor. Um, It it is a history of right-wing media uh, in post-World War II America. And, you know, it it falls in the category of those things in life that I thought I knew a lot about. And then I read this book and I thought what I knew was half wrong, half right, glimpses of this and that, you know. Um, But what, what really establishes here is that after World War II, uh, there was really two guys that got together and they started this, what was in essence, almost a mimeograph newsletter in their apartment in Washington called human events. And when I was coming up, it was considered so right wing, we would refer to it as inhuman events. And that that kind of became the Steve Jobs garage of right wing media. And that everything sort of went through that. And it developed a sense that mainstream media was, not the truth, that it fell to us to tell the truth. And just as a side note, what's really fascinating about that, Victor, is the two guys who started that, they came out of the anti-war movement. One was a professor at Haverford. One had had connections to Haverford and wrote a book in the 30s about the first big book on the international arms trade called Merchants of Death. And their view of this, and this is just mind-boggling, was that the United States media had been co-opted in World War II by sort of a jingoistic pro-American, pro-war, and that the otherness that they were trying to separate, the truth that they saw, was distinguished from that. Now, I would have thought it was the exact opposite, that right-wing media would have come from crazy right-wing, let's go, you know, nuke North Korea. Um, But out of that, it's and so I think what has happened here is very clearly, and this is really the genesis of, of why we started Resolute Square. Um, those on the right have thought that their side was never being told. So they started Fox, and then Fox is just really a small part now of what is this vast infrastructure of Ben Shapiro right, craziness, right. you know. Um, those who, and, and those really have become the, the autocratic forces. Those who didn't have that, who were like mainstream, like what we would call normal people, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we had great faith that our traditional media would carry that. So we didn't need to start uh, Fox News because we had NBC, we had ABC, we had CBS, we had CNN. We didn't need to go start Breitbart News because we had the New York Times or Washington Post. And we saw them as an adequate counter. They would tell the truth. The truth would win. That all broke down because it was based upon the concept that on both sides, you would have some sort of civil agreement on fundamental truths. Right. right. So it, it goes back to this, uh, you know, all of our journalist friends we see struggling with this. And I have great sympathy for them, actually. 
and when you are brought up in a profession that is revered, that the greatest good is objectivity. Mm-hmm. That is the greatest good. How do you tell both sides of a lie? Right, right. And, and, and I think that that everybody, you know, from Maggie Haberman to to you know Anderson Cooper would say, we don't know. And, and what Resolute Square was about is forming. What is bizarre is that there is not a pro democracy advocate voice dedicated to that that doesn't call itself a news organization, that isn't burdened by this obligation to tell both sides of a lie. And that is what Resolute Square is. Um, I mean, our, our approach here is not objectivity. Our approach is we're right, they're wrong. Yeah. So, so if, I can, if I can ask you a follow-up question yeah. to that, and I totally agree with you that the both sides of them is, is stunning. I mean, on issues like democracy and the violent insurrection on January 6th, there just isn't two sides to that. On things like, you know, what uh, Nazism and, 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 you know, the Nick Fuente situation, there were no two sides to that. And so there, there's this, I think, level of comfortability that we've seen, especially with right-wing channels of just basically lying and feeding their audience a bunch of um, lies. And I'm wondering first who you think their audience is and whether or not you think there's a way to reach those people who are in tune to Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity, who are, you know, spew these just nonsense headlines. Is there a way for us to reach them in this kind of ecosystem? Well, look, you know, I, I, it's a great, great question. Um, I, I think well, first, as to who they are, they are predominantly white, mm-hmm. overwhelmingly. They are predominantly older, and they are predominantly male. Um, the, you know, in campaigns, I was always a great believer, you should do what is easy first well. Mm-hmm. So go out and get your base vote first, and then see what else you need to get. Because y- you don't want to end up spending all this time and money trying to get 5% of the vote and neglect the 75% that you didn't turn out enough that was very easy to do. So when I look at this, I have really, and this sounds crass, but it's honest, I don't really have any interest in converting those people now. I I don't think that's that's the immediate goal here. I think the immediate goal is... To, we know that there are more of us than there are of them. Right, right. So we don't need them. What we need is the people who believe what we believe to think it's important enough to take action, which is something you hit every day. I love reading and following you because, oh. you know, you're pointing out the urgency of what this moment is, be it, you know, a, a, a mass shooting every two hours in, in, in California to, um, you know, the absurdity of... Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene having a veto power and who's going to go on the intelligence yeah, committee. Yeah. Um, so, you know, still the greatest number of people, the, the greatest voice in America is a voice that isn't spoken, people who don't register and vote, who could register and vote. And what Trump did in 16, he turned out low-frequency yeah. white voters. Now, Look, I, I did five presidential campaigns. And in the Romney campaign, 2012, you could look at polls, Victor, and you could see there was a group of people that if you went out with a xenophobic, racist message, that would light them up. Now, you know, we obviously didn't even consider that because, you know, Romney would have thrown you out of the room if nothing else. <laughs> um, but I would have had you asked me as like a political consultant. If you can you do that? I would have said, if you do that, you will lose the votes that you gain. You will lose more votes at the upper end of college educated voters. Mm -hmm. And that's what was happening with Trump right up into the Comey letter in 16. And Trump was losing college educated voters. No Republican has ever lost college educated voters in modern politics. Mm -hmm. Goldwater won college educated voters. So, um, What happened was because the establishment stayed behind Trump, he gave those voters permission. So he was able for a brief moment in time, and literally I think it was probably for a 48-hour period, to have the best of both worlds. 
he was able to get this, you know, vote that is came out motivated by racism and xenophobia without losing sort of normal suburban moms, we call them. Um, that ha- that didn't happen in six in twenty as much. In part, I think the Lincoln Project played a large role in that. Um, you know, usually the last to join a campaign are the first to leave, yeah. which makes sense when you think about it. If you're the most reluctant, uh, I'm going to join this at the last minute, you're still going to have the most doubts. So you're like, yeah, I don't know, man, maybe that was a mistake. I mean, if you're all in from the beginning, you're going to be the last to leave. You're, yeah. you know, you're a true believer. Um, so our focus needs to be not on conversion, but on motivation. That's really interesting. And I, I want to ask you about that, and, and especially for Democrats and, and us in the pro-democracy space. How do you think we can, I guess, respond to the right-wing machine? You know, they, they spew things like critical race theory. They spew things that, like you said, are racist, xenophobic, that really promote this divisive, vitriolic culture. What should we as people who care about democracy, and, and I know yesterday you were on with uh, um, some other people at Resolute Square talking about what President Biden can do to push back against that. What are some tangible ways that we can push back against this right-wing narrative? Listen, I, I think um, that th- there needs to be an unburdening of normal bounds of civility that we tend to operate on. We were mm-hmm. taught that it's rude to call someone a liar. Right. Yeah. We, we, we were taught that we should assume that the other person in an argument, they may be wrong, but they're acting in good faith. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are both sides to this, right? So I, I think we need to just go out and, you know, I, we need to call Marjorie Taylor Greene a Russian agent. Mm-hmm. We need to say that, that we do know that Putin supported Trump. Trump won. We know that Marjorie Taylor Greene is pro-Putin. We know there wouldn't be a Marjorie Taylor Greene if there wasn't Trump. And there's a direct line to that. Um, so I, I think you need to just go out and call these things out for what it is. Yeah. I, you know, I, <clears throat> Democrats don't realize it enough, which kind of drives me crazy. But Democrats are winning cultural wars, right? I mean, think of the big cultural wars of the last couple of years, right? Uh, uh, Donald Trump, right wing MAGA against Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Mm-hmm. Well, who won that? Colin, Nike made nine billion dollars after Colin Kaepernick, right? The, they got uh, the MAGA got in a fight with Walmart for a while over mandatory masks. Walmart, you're, you're <laughs> losing that with Walmart. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're not like say they went after, you know, some you know obscure little boutique. They went after well. They lost a, 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 a cultural battle with NASCAR over banning the Confederate flag. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you are winning these cultural battles. How many people do you know, Victor, under 35, who are like normal people who are really big on MAGA? Not they, many. They, no. You got to hunt them with dogs. Right. You know, nobody wants to be these people. And it, you know, like I grew up in Mississippi and your average kid in Mississippi, they don't want to be Robert E. Lee. They want to be like a black rap star. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, like they want, they swim in the same cultural sea. And it, I think there needs to be an engagement on this, the, these cultural issues. Don't shy away from them. Yeah. Go out, say you're wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and what, what has always struck me about Democrats is I wrote a piece about this right before the 20 election. Uh, that was in the bulwark. Be more confident. Get a little <laughs> swagger. You know, I mean, you, you're right. They're wrong. It's it's yours. There's yeah. more of you. Don't be tentative about this. You know, this is your country. Go out and take it. Yeah. yeah. And w- walk with confidence. It, it, I mean, it reminds me of what Michelle Obama said, you know, Democrats have this tendency to when they go low, we go high. And, you know, for, for things like saving democracy, I mean, we have to be in the same level as them because they're not going to go any higher than they already are. So hey, hey, listen, you know, one of the great we had this wonderful guy who did most of the social media for the Lincoln Project. And during one of the debates, there was a reference to go high, go low. And he tweeted, well, when they go low, we go lower, lower. Right. And it was one of our most popular yeah, tweets yeah, yeah. ever. So. 
Um, look, I, I, I think that is true when it means passion and when it means yeah. conviction. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's a need to go out and you know speculate whether or not Kevin McCarthy is having an affair with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. For one thing, I don't think it's very effective. Yeah. The other thing is sort of a horrifying thought. So, yeah. I mean, like, God, you get know, that out of my mind. But, yeah, keep it out of your mind. But I, I think you can say, you know, how bizarre it is that they have this weirdly strange, abnormal relationship that is dangerous not only to the country but to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Stuart Stevens, this was such a wonderful conversation and, and truly so grateful for you to join us. Please follow Stuart on Twitter and, and read his columns every week on uh, Resolute Square. It's a, it's a great, he has a great, great pieces. So Stuart, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Victor, thank you, man. And I, I read everything you're doing. I love that you're with Resolute Square um, and you're going to save the world. So oh, get at it. Too kind. Thanks so much, Stephen. All right, brother. Stuart. Take care. Bye. Bye. Well, that was a fascinating episode, and, and I couldn't agree more with what Stuart said about the fact that we must call these lies out. And, and anyone who watches my um, other show with Jill Weinbank, she has a great hashtag, which I think puts it all kind of in, in summary, which is say this, not that, right? If we're calling January 6th just another protest, it's not a protest, it's an insurrection. So we have to call these things out like we see it. So say this, not that, that couldn't be more important. There's some breaking news um, that we want to get into. Yesterday, uh, right before, I guess in the morning, CNN reported that Mike Pence's Indiana home was searched by the FBI. Basically, one of the lawyers for Mike Pence gave the FBI about a dozen classified documents. And, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that no one should be possessing classified documents, whether it's Trump, Biden or Mike Pence. But there's a key difference here, which I think we'll kind of get into more as we know more about the facts, which is that for President Biden and Mike Pence, the facts are more similar than that of Trump. So basically what I mean is that it seems like they're cooperating with law enforcement officials. It seems like they are turning over documents voluntarily. They aren't resisting. Whereas for Trump, the key difference is obstruction. He's someone who has resisted calls to turn back the documents, who has um, really kind of called for this special master. I mean, it's someone who has tried to evade the process of accountability and handing over of classified information. And so there's a, key dif there's a key difference between, I think, what you're seeing with Pence and Biden and Trump. At the end of the day, no one should be possessing classified documents, but it's that response that matters. And so um, we'll, we'll see all what happens uh, going forward with Mike Pence. But, you know, it's just like kind of drip, drip, drip from uh, these people who are in office. And I think we really ought to look at what we can do to reform that classified documents and, and taking documents process, because clearly it's not working very well. Um, the next thing I have for you is some news out of the House. There's some drama between uh, Republicans and Democrats in terms of who can sit on key committees. So yesterday, Kevin McCarthy sent a letter to Hakeem Jeffries saying that he is booting, uh, get this, Eric Swallow and Adam Schiff off of the House Intel Committee. Meanwhile, uh, people who are on those committees have denied the 2020 election results, who are uh, clearly, I think, to me at least, not worthy of possessing intelligence and and entrusting our nation's most classified information. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's just really unfortunate. Kevin McCarthy is kind of going on this revenge show because he thought that Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff were two people who really held Trump's feet to the fire and held Republicans' feet to the fire. And now he's making them pay the price for it. And I think it's just petty politics. And we all have to kind of pay attention to this because the people who they are installing aren't principled people, aren't convicted people. They are people who, again, have denied the results of the 2020 election and who continue to undermine the functioning of democracy. And so I think we should all be concerned about that. Um, so that's all I have for you today. We'll be paying attention to the House as well as what happens with Pence and uh, all of that. And just a quick programming note for the rest of the week. We are already on Wednesday, which is crazy. But tomorrow we have a very exciting guest. We have an exclusive interview with Pramila Jayapal, who is a, as you know, a congresswoman from the state of Washington. We'll talk to her about what Republicans are doing, what Democrats plan to do um, to, to make lives better and to push back against them. It'll be a great interview. She is a fierce voice in the House and such a great representative. Pramila Jayabal will be tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then on Friday, get excited for this. We're going to have on the person who challenged Lauren Boebert in Colorado. He is Adam Frisch. And we'll talk about 
what it will take to beat Lauren Boebert, who he lost by just a little over 500 votes, which is basically nothing in politics. So we'll talk about that, what went wrong in 2022, and what we can do better in 2024. Uh, Adam Frisch will be on Friday. And again, both of those will be at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. You won't want to miss them. We'll be right here on youtube.com slash Politicon. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I will see you all tomorrow. In the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday.